Hi, everyone. I'm Adrienne LaFrance, The Atlantic's executive editor. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation about the end of Row. I want to say a special welcome to our subscribers and welcome, of course, to two of our contributing writers, Mary Ziegler, a legal historian who writes regularly for The Atlantic, and David French, a constitutional lawyer who also writes regularly, including his Atlantic newsletter, The Third Rail. Mary, David, thank you both so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks, Adrian. So let's jump right in. Um, lots to talk about, of course. And I wanted to start big um, with a question. I mean, you've both been, you, you know, thinking about Amer law in America for decades. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can put this decision into historical context for us. We all know it's big, but how big in your legal careers, in your lives as, as American citizens, what compares? Mary, maybe you can go first. I mean, I think I'm probably prejudiced by the fact that I study this, but this is the biggest decision of my lifetime. Um, this is at least the biggest decision since I've been paying attention to law um, since I was in law school in the aughts. So um, it's I, I can't think of anything um, bigger than this. I mean, you can think of things that seemed like Bush v. Gore was a big deal. Um, there can be this this Supreme Court is doing a lot of big things. But I, I think the reversal of a case like Roe, which is by almost every indication, the best known of the Supreme Court's decisions. Um, I think it's hard to understate the importance of that. David, how about for you? I'm a little older than Mary, so I can't say it's the most important the biggest in my lifetime, it's tied with Roe. It's the biggest of my lifetime. I would, if Roe was an earthquake, Dobbs is also an earthquake. Um, and so I, I agree completely. If you're looking at um, really, I would say American jurisprudence since Brown v. Board of Education, I would say it's the biggest case, both Roe and Dobbs going in opposite direction are the biggest cases since Brown v. Board of Education. The, the revocation of a constitutionally protected right is unusual, if not unprecedented. And I wanted to ask you both about the, the closest parallel. Again, this is sort of to try to get us in the right hi historic um, mindset here. Uh, my colleague, David Fromm, recently made an, an interesting comparison to uh, the end of prohibition. Obviously not quite the same thing, but I wonder sort of when you cast back to how we can place this in context for our country, particularly with regard to the revocation of a, of a right, what comes to mind for you? Uh, David, I don't know if you want to take that one first. Yeah, that's a really hard question because I think the pro-life position is that there isn't, it isn't cleanly a revocation of a right. It's also that there is the potential for the granting of a right. In other words, the right to life, if should a state or the federal government choose to do so through the democratic process. So it's a, it's a complicated uh, framing for the case because the framing, whether it's a revocation of a right, full stop, which obviously at least part, part of the decision is, or also the potential to grant additional rights really often depends on sort of where you're coming from this uh, at this angle. So you're going to see um, folks on the pro-choice side are saying this is a revocation of a right full stop and are going to have a hard time sort of finding a, con a, a comparison, right? Because you're looking at it and you're saying, wait a minute, where, where has the Supreme Court so clearly said, here's a right you once had, now you do not have that right. From the pro-life side, you're looking at it more as a granting of a potential right to life, which then you're going to compare it more to, say, a granting, a, a reversal of a, of a revocation of rights of Plessy, to a, a Plessy v. Ferguson, to a granting of rights under Brown v. Board of Education. So this is one because we're so divided on this, the frame with which you view it is going to be incredibly divided as well. And even um, to take the sort of pro-life frame that you described in Mary, I wanna to go to you in a minute as well, but for the pro-life framing of it, the sort of revocation, but also granting, is there any other, can you think of any other corollary? Not really. I mean, I, you know, one of the things that when I think about abortion jurisprudence, one of the things I say to people all the time is abortion is different. It's, it's been sort of a different thing in many ways from the beginning. It's a different way, a different thing now as we're analyzing it. And so there is something exceptional about this jurisprudence that I think doesn't have such a neat analog elsewhere. How about for you, Mary, when you think about trying to place this in a historic context with regard to the revocation of a right or however you might frame it, where does your mind go? 
I mean, I can't think of anything. I mean, so the closest analogs, the Supreme Court had created a right to, to freedom of contract in the early 20th century in a case called Lochner. But that wasn't really under, it wasn't experienced, I don't think, by anyone as an individual liberty as often. I think some people probably did, but often it was used by employers to challenge, you know, laws protecting workers like minimum wage or maximum hour laws. Uh, the Supreme Court, obviously, at one point in the 70s said the death penalty was unconstitutional and then reversed course um, after states made some adjustments to their laws and reinstated the death penalty. So maybe you could say there was, you know, a freedom from execution that was granted and then taken away. But that that analogy doesn't really work either. And I think even from a, a pro-life standpoint, the analogy to Plessy isn't really perfect either, because from Plessy to Brown, you had you know, from a pro-life perspective, taking away of rights um, in what would have been a taking away of rights in Plessy, and then a granting of rights in Brown, like an affirmative guarantee of equal protection, which is not what Dobbs really is. Dobbs is essentially saying, um, at least if you believe Justice Alito, or, you know, in the words of Justice Kavanaugh, the, this, we're neutral, right? Like, we're out of this. This is up to you guys to figure out, which is makes the parallel to Brown a little tricky, too. Um, so I think if we're talking about, you um, really, I think from a pro-choice perspective, the destruction of a right, and even from a pro-life perspective, the destruction of a right in the opening, as David says, of the possibility of states thinking about rights, but not really the granting of a right, which makes this even, to me, even more unusual, right? I mean, what this is, is, is unique, um, I think, and hard for me to find a parallel to. Right. So, and I want to go back in, in a few moments to the question of the, the specific justices and sort of how they've laid this out. But um, for now, we've established it's huge, which we all know, <laughs> and possibly unprecedented, or at least very hard to sort of place in, in legal historic context. Um, I want to talk about something, Mary, that you wrote in a recent article for us at The Atlantic. And I'll quote you for a moment. Uh, what you wrote was, if this decision signals anything bigger than its direct consequences, it is this, no one should get used to their rights. Talk about that a little bit. And I know, I mean, particularly in Justice Thomas's concurrence, there's a hint at where this could go. But I'm, I'm curious to hear what you're thinking about when or what you were thinking about when you wrote that. Well, I think there were there were sort of two sets of things I was thinking about. One one set of things involved methodology. Right. So the court lays out a method um, for defining our constitutional rights based on what the court describes as history um, and tradition. And that methodology um, as Justice Thomas, I think, elucidates pretty nicely, could mean that a lot of rights we thought we had, we don't really have. Um, another set of things that was occurring to me were kind of more institutional concerns. Um, this court has been, I think, more interested in undoing precedents if things were egregiously wrong, to use the court's words, and less worried about the kind of institutional commitments that come with adhering to old decisions or past precedent than other reports that I'm familiar with, right? I mean, maybe you can say, if you go back to the 60s era liberal Warren court, maybe that wasn't true. But I think for all of those reasons, this is a court that seems to be committed to its interpretive approach to the constitution, not really worried about institutionalist kinds of concerns about perceived judicial legitimacy or precedent, um, and committed to an approach to implied constitutional rights that if you were being logically consistent, would lead you to call into question a variety of constitutional rights. So if this is how the court is doing business, both from an interpretive standpoint and from an institutional standpoint, we just don't know what's gonna happen next. Like, I'm not sure, I'm not here to tell you, I know they're gonna take away this right or that right or any rights, but I think it creates a, a climate of pretty extreme uncertainty. Um, if you had asked me, and I imagine probably if you'd asked David two years ago, um, do you think the Supreme Court will overturn Roe v. Wade in two years in a decision like this. I mean, I, I can tell you a lot of constitutional commentators would have said no way. Um, and I think we're living in a time where the Overton window is rapidly changing and there, there are signs in the opinion itself that that's true. So um, what I was thinking when I wrote that was just that anyone who can guarantee you that they know what will happen next when it comes to this court, I think is, is mistaken. I, I don't think we can know. So David, two years ago, if someone had asked you, would this happen? What do you think you would have said? I would have said no, and I would have been on pretty good grounds to say no, because mm -hmm. Justice Ginsburg was still alive. And um, as we saw from the Justice Roberts concurrence, he didn't join in fully overturning Roe versus Wade. So at most, there were four justices two years ago. And, and so it was the addition of Amy Coney Barrett that completely changed the dynamic. The thing that surprised me, and this is something that I did not see happening, the court's ruling in one sense is 6-3. It's 6-3 it's on, on the narrow ground of upholding the Mississippi law. 
but it's more of five four on the larger ground of do you entirely overrule Roe v. Wade? And I was, if I had been predicting this, which is why predictions are a perilous business, I would have said, I don't see a court overruling Roe v. Wade five four. I could see there was a, you know, there was a, a joke that people used to say, um, Justice Roberts will be a reliable seventh vote to overturn Roe. That in other words, it would it would be something that would be uh, if Roe is overturned, it's going to be by a supermajority. Uh, so the five fourness of the overturning was in fact a surprise for me, and another illustration of why predictions are a perilous business. And, yeah, and I, how- I thought the same. I mean, I would have said the same thing. I, I was going to ask how much of your surprise, David, comes from what the justices have said or had said in confirmation hearings. I know people have made a lot of this, and, and then I'll we'll go back to the other question of sort of uh, logical consistency on the court. Yeah. No surprise at all based on the confirmation. It, the, 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 the language in the confirmation hearings was very lawyerly. Um, a phrase like settled precedent kind of just means precedent is precedent until it's not. Um, and so. So by the, very lawyerly, do you mean like evasive or ambiguous? Just to impress you on that a little here, bit. I know you're both here's, lawyers. <laughs> here's how I would put it. I would put it as a lawyer listening. I saw, I thought, I see what you're doing. Got it. Um, if I'm a member of the public, I'm thinking something different. So it is what I would call legally precise and publicly misleading. Is that a, a way uh, of, of describing what happened? I think the yeah. other thing, but the thing that more surprised me more is that prior to the overturning of Roe, only one justice of the nine had said clearly, hey, we need to overturn Roe. And that was Justice Thomas in in actual court opinions. So um, in June Medical, uh, he he dissent he dissented and or and he dissented and said, "Hey, we need to call into question Roe Casey." And so we had one justice on the record as a justice saying Roe Casey need to go. The other eight had not, and and the other eight, uh, with the exception of Barrett, who wasn't on the court yet, had upheld or struck down cases that were that were not that did not fundamentally challenge Roe. So until Dobbs, it was a lot of speculation. Um, back to the, the sort of question of consistency, I, I've seen a lot of people question, you know, one of the decisions that came out just before Roe was overturned had to do with concealed handguns in New York and the sense that, uh, you know, the, and please forgive me if I'm characterizing this imprecisely, I'll rely on you to correct me. Um, but this decision to strike down New York's restrictions on concealed carry by the Supreme Court rather than letting the state decide. And there's this perceived sort of flip of like, well, in that case, they wanted the court to decide in the case of Roe, they're saying the state should decide. Do you see that as a logical inconsistency? Is that oversimplified? Mary, maybe I'll start with you. Well, I think obviously, um, if you agree with the court's methodology, you can try to justify them as consistent. Obviously, the court um, would, if, if you were the court, you would say the right to bear arms is in the text of the Constitution, the right to abortion is not. Um, the court's reading of history, which, um, you know, I, I know more about the history of the abortion debate than I do about the history of debates about the right to bear arms, but the court would say the history is different. And if we're looking at the history and tradition as our guide, um, then that helps to justify the answer. But there are some obvious inconsistencies. In the gun case, Bruin, the court looked at um, history from after the ratification. Um, well, I think there, there was an inconsistency. I won't get into the weeds as much on this about what history you look at. Do you look at history after the ratification of the relevant constitutional amendment or not? That wasn't handled, I think, the same way in the two decisions. And then there's just, I think, broader questions about um, how consistent judges are going to be when they're doing history without the assistance of um, professional historians and sometimes without even citing professional historians um, or probably reading a lot of professional historians. So I think there were um, certainly, I think within and between opinions, some questions about whether history is, is constraining the court in the way that the court defines it. I think obviously I'm, I'm not going to tell you that politics don't creep into the opinions of all the justices, but I think it would be kind of disingenuous to claim that history somehow removes the politics only of a subset of the justices when that doesn't appear to be the case in their rulings. David, how about for you? Do you see this as an inconsistency or how would you frame it? 
So I would, uh, I'm going to agree and disagree with Mary. So I'm going to, here's the part I'm going to agree on. I thought the historical analysis in New York State Rifle and Pistol was curious. And, and here's what I mean by curious. There was a lot of history. I mean, it, it spanned seven, 800 years of history from, you know, English common, the development of English common law until the 20th century and moving into the 21st century. And, and in the majority opinion, Justice Thomas was sort of, here's the window of history that really matters. And here's the part of history that doesn't really matter. And then here, even in the window that does matter, here's the stuff we're going to say was an outlier. And here's the stuff. It was a, a very complicated historical analysis. Whereas somebody who takes a more textual approach, approach says, wait a minute, it says the right of the people to keep and bear arms. So under the New York formulation, you didn't have a right to bear arms. You had to satisfy a, a government official that you had a need to bear arms. And so it, there was no actual right to bear arms. It's a much simpler analysis when it dives into the textual element of it. But I think Justice Thomas, not to get too much into the weeds and guns on an abortion um, uh, broadcast, but he was also wanting to settle what is the test that applies going forward and then trying to lay down the parameters of the test because the text history and tradition on guns, the history and tradition is all over the place for a long time. And so then he's saying, do text history and tradition. And oh, by the way, here's the, here are the narrow historical frames to use. Um, now, when it comes to the uh, analysis of abortion, which is analysis of an unenumerated right, it's not specifically spelled out in the constitution, but nobody seriously thinks that all of the rights that we possess have to be spelled out in the constitution. You know, the constitution doesn't even say that all of the rights that we possess are spelled out in the constitution. So then you get into this really tricky kind of analysis as to what are the rights that you possess that are not in the text, because we know there are some, but which are they? What are they? And that's that's where, you know, when you're talking to non-lawyers about this who haven't been in this, they just start to say, wait, what? Hold on. So there's rights not in the Constitution, and everybody agrees on that, but we don't agree on what they really are. Right. It's well, and, and the question of, you know, b women not being considered the way that they would be today as full citizens at the time when it was written. So there's a lot of like, just, you, you know, you see this a lot, of course, people saying like, it, it, this is a very old document. It's a very important document, but certainly times evolve. Um, I, don't, I also don't want to get too deep on guns, but, but hearing you talk just now made me wonder, thinking back to the framework, the sort of pro-life framework for this, that um, yes, there's a revocation of a right, but also granting a right to the, to the life of a, a fetus or a child. Um, couldn't that same argument legally be used for guns as well? That we, yes, we have this right to bear arms, but we also have a right not to be killed by guns. Like, is that like, if I'm sort of trying to take this to its logical conclusion. Well, you do have a right not to be killed unlawfully by guns. And that, that's why we have murder statutes and things like that. And so, um, and the other thing about the Bruin case, it was really a lot narrower in many ways than a lot of people have been talking about, because mm. essentially when you dive right down to it, it was Heller outside the home. In other words, I just have, I do have a right to bear arms outside the home, but I don't have a right to be free of a licensing scheme. So, you know, states can impose a licensing scheme, which can require training and payment of, you know, fingerprinting and background checks and all of this. But what made the ruling, to me, honestly, somewhat confusing was Thomas's effort to settle some confusion. Mm. So he tried to settle confusion about the test, uh, what judicial test will be applied going forward. And he calls and then he says, what's well, it's not a balancing test like intermediate scrutiny. It's going to be this text history tradition thing. But if you ask me, what is the text history and tradition argument about assault weapons or magazine capacity? I'm a little, I'm a little lost on that, to be honest, um, as to what, how that text history and tradition analysis applies to assault weapons or to magazine capacity. Now we're going to shift back to Roe, uh, and I know Mary, you've smartly alluded to the fact that you're you're not going to speculate about the future too much, um, which is wise. But I am curious for your thoughts on sort of the legal ripple effects here. You know, I've seen lots of people raise concerns about how enforcement will work, what it'll look like questions about state surveillance of mail or 
period tracking apps, that sort of thing. Where do you see, as you kind of cast out days, weeks, months, where do you see the legal ripple effects sort of to be most complicated or compelling or interesting to you? Yeah, I mean, I think the real challenge is that obviously the world has changed since the last time abortion was a crime. It was always hard to enforce abortion laws, right? Um, And that's one of the reasons we have pretty good historical evidence that the most consistent enforcement we had was when um, the pregnant person died too, because there was clear evidence that the abortion had occurred. And that, that enforcement difficulty is compounded by the availability of medication abortion and by the kind of commitment of most people in the pro-life movement and most states who've spoken out on the matter, although I know there are people in the pro-life movement, David has written about this, the abortion abolitionists who disagree on this point, but the commitment not to punish women and pregnant people. So you have these kind of, I think those things are in real tension with one another because of the availability of medication abortion. People can get abortion medication on the internet from Europe, right? And then if the commitment of the state is to punish either one, only the doctor, that's going to be virtually impossible in that kind of situation. Or um, in some instances, states like the National Right to Life Committee, which is a pro-life group, has championed this really sweeping definition of accomplice liability um, that would cover some things that come pretty close to speech um, or kind of be straddling the line between speech and conduct. Um, That's another possible solution. We, But I think one thing we've seen some states signal interest in, um, so South Dakota is having a special session to consider new um, regulations on abortion. And some lawmakers there have signaled their interest in trying to regulate out-of-state conduct, right? So saying if someone from South Dakota goes to Minnesota to get an abortion, South Dakota is going to tell the doctor in Minnesota what information they need to tell that person before they get an abortion. Some states have said, if you go, if we ban abortion for our citizens and our citizens travel to a state where abortion is legal, we don't, you know, that's illegal too. We're gonna try to reach that doctor in that other state. Um, we've seen states saying, you know, we don't want advertising about abortion in our states, which, of course, um, implicates First Amendment concerns. So I think um, the challenge of enforcement and um, how much states are going to try to do things like surveillance, like regulating interstate conduct, like kind of coming up right to the line between speech and conduct. I think that's going to potentially be something to watch. And it's something that could polarize us further, too, because, of course, I think what the Supreme Court was describing or hoping for in the Dobbs decision was a world in which abortion going back to the states would de-escalate the abortion conflict. And if this enforcement problem becomes acute enough, it could could polarize the conflict even more because states would be trying to tell each other what to do rather than having some kind of top-down solution that's imposed on everyone, probably making people angry, but at least diffusing some of these interstate battles that we might see starting. I'm not sure, but that's that's what I'm worried about and what I'm watching. I'm glad you brought up polarization because this is actually something I wanted to ask you about, David. I know you have written in the past that after this period of of sort of shock and rage among progressive America, that you thought that this decision might actually help depolarize America. And I'm I'm wondering if you'd explain that position. I'm thinking in particular, I've been sort of looking at the map of where the most, um, you know, where abortion will be most clearly banned or likely to be banned. And it really, I mean, it really maps pretty cleanly onto established red blue lines. And so right. talk about th- this view of yours, if you would. Yeah. So I do not dispute in the slightest bit that in the short to medium term, you're going to be talking about a lot of polarization, a lot of anger. And as Mary outlined, a lot of confusion, because one thing that we have to realize is a lot of the pro-life laws that are on the books now were passed when no one thought they would go into effect. Mm-hmm. And so it was performative legislation in a, in a, yep. in a way. And so now there's a lot of confusion as to what is the law actually going to be. You've got states with competing statutes out there. So there's going to be polarization compounded by confusion. All right. Now, if you take a longer view, is there a hope that you would have something along the lines of a democratic settlement to the issue that makes abortion so much less polarizing in other countries around the world? So Europe, for example, has long had more restrictive abortion laws than the United States. Uh, And the United States could not, under Roe and Casey, move to, the people couldn't vote to move to a European um, sort of settlement because Roe and Casey prohibited that. So- And and quickly, just so to bring people along, when you say, when you reference these more restrictive laws, it's things like an earlier cutoff for when abortion is permissible. Um, So- Right. France, for example, has a 14 week cutoff, right. except in rare circumstances. And other countries are, are similar to that. And 
Um, but under Roe, because a 14 week Roe and Casey, because a 14 week cutoff was pre viability, there wasn't any prospect. You, if you voted for that, if the people wanted that, they couldn't have that. And so the longer term hope on the polarization point is that a democratic settlement will mean that abortion takes a position that is um, similar to the lack of prominence it has, say, in Europe. Now, the thing about that is the kinds of European style laws uh, on the on the pro-life side, they're not particularly happy with that. And then lots of folks on the pro-choice side are not particularly happy with that. But it looks like there's a big group of Americans in the middle who are roughly there, but they don't drive the conversation about abortion in the way the different wings do. So I, you know, that's my, because other nations have settled this issue through democratically without the kind of trauma and drama that we have endured over the last 50 years. And uh, that's why I have a longer term sense of hope, but I completely acknowledge in the short term, you're gonna have shock and anger and a heck of a lot of confusion. And then I'd add to that, a lot of division you'll start to see on the pro-life movement. Yeah, um, I agree with almost all of that. I mean, and I, I think I even, I sort of even share David's hope on the polarization point. I, although I would add that I don't think we would ever get there through partisan politics, because I think that the 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 kind of, ex, this sort of gravitation to what the movements are doing is happening in our parties too. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it would probably, we've seen a little bit of this in Michigan and in Kansas, right? States that are very different, but going directly to voters, I think we may see the sort of a more stable kind of European style solution from coming from voters. I don't know if we would get that from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party as they're currently constituted. And David, when you you referenced or sort of alluded to the idea that there could be a split among pro-lifers, do you think that that, describe that for me, is it is, is yeah. the sense that there's no um, case ever in which abortion would be okay versus maybe there are some exceptions or what what sort of fault lines do you see emerging? So there's two fault lines. Fault line number one is this sort of philosophical fault line, fault line between what you would call the mainstream pro-life movement, which has always said there uh, should be no punishment of the mm. of women and also that there should be a, uh, exceptions for um, life and you know physical health of the mother for example and the quote-unquote abolitionist movement which is now and you're seeing it arise more in the um, more fundamentalist religious wings of the religious conservative world and they would say no exceptions for life in some cases they would say um, yes, prosecute women. And the most prominent example of that was an abolitionist style resolution passed two annual meetings ago of the Southern Baptist Convention, which was, uh, which the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, extremely politically powerful. Uh, there's some, in, some controversies to whether people knew what they were voting for really, but it was absolutely an abolitionist um, resolution. Then the other division is between those who want to prioritize right now support for, uh, you know, if you have a state with a heartbeat bill going into uh, into to um, enforce being enforced, do you do you then now prioritize support for women and babies, or are you going to prioritize creative ways to ban abortion and outside the state lines or creative ways to try to um, prohibit the importation of abortion pills? So what is the emphasis going to be? right now in those pro-life states that already have pro-life laws on the books? Is it going to be the support for women and mothers? And a lot of mainstream pro-life groups are saying, we need to do that, we need to do that. Whereas a lot of grassroots politicians who are very much caught up in the performative punitive culture of, of a lot of right-wing politics right now are gonna really press on the punitive side. And mm. so that's gonna be, that's gonna be a, a division. It's been noteworthy to me. Oh, and I should pause and say, we will go to people's questions. Um, I have a, have a couple more and then I'll, I'll, we'll go to some other questions. Um, it, it's been noteworthy to me to watch basically, you know, the, the entire medical establishment come out against this decision, really focusing on the, you know, the woman or the, the pregnant person's uh, well-being. And we know that pregnancy is an inherently risky condition. So my legal question about this is, knowing now that the the state is requiring women to assume this risk do is there any legal re recourse for women to protect themselves like does 
is this a hint at where the legal fight could go? Or I, I'm just sort of trying to understand that piece of it. I don't know, Mary, if you want to start or. Do you mean way. like legal recourse if people want to get care their states aren't offering? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Or, you know, we've seen in other countries where abortion has been banned and interventions, medical interventions that would otherwise be made to save the life of the mother have not been taken. And then mm -hmm. someone dies. We certainly we know that some women will die as a result of not being able to get medical intervention in this case. And so do you expect there will be lawsuits around that? And how is it how do you expect that to play out legally? Yeah, I mean, I think that there there already are some state constitutional um, suits about that. Um, I think there's there's a kind of OK, even for this Supreme Court claim that if states, um, as some I think David alluded to, some um, Republican candidates have suggested they would eliminate life of the pregnant person exceptions. Other states, I think, are not doing that so much as narrowing them so much and then heightening penalties so much that a lot of doctors might not want to take the risk of interpreting an emergency exception um, in a way with which prosecutors disagree and then mm. ending up in prison for, you know, 10 years, 99 years life in some instances. Um, and so I think, you know, obviously there should be, um, I think, politically pressure on states not to define emergency exceptions in this way, right? To define emergency exceptions in ways that actually allow doctors to afford women and pregnant people life-saving care, including in circumstances where they're not even having abortions, but in cases where they're seeking abortions as well. Um, there's a decent constitutional argument that life of the pregnant person exceptions are correct even under the Supreme Court's interpretation, because at the time that states were banning abortion, in the 19th century, they almost were universally including exceptions for life of the pregnant person. So states that are choosing not to do that or defining that so narrowly that people are going to die, maybe acting, I think, are acting more harshly than states were even in the 19th century. Um, there's federal law um, on uh, the treatment of it was generally about sort of doctors trying to offload patients, but federal law that could be kind of leverage to say that there is an emergency medical exception in federal law broader than the ones in some state laws. So I think there, there's definitely steps that people um, could take. I think the real challenge is not necessarily, I think that legislators are intending for people to die if they have in incomplete miscarriages. I, I don't think that's necessarily true, but there's a dynamic between um, this sort of ever- ratcheting up of penalties, right, um, of increasing penalties way beyond anything we saw in the 19th century criminal abortion laws, and the narrowing of emergency exceptions, and then asking doctors to say, okay, here's a patient who's presenting with what they say is a life-threatening circumstance. Are you willing to risk your career and your liberty on your interpretation of whether this is an emergency or not? And many doctors are just not willing to do that. So I think that the, how punitive the laws have become is really what's putting people at risk. It's not just the act of banning abortion. It's not even just the act of criminalizing abortion, although I think that's a big piece of it. It's the degree to which states want to punish people that's making doctors second guess whether these are real emergencies or emergencies they could defend in a court of law before a prosecutor. Mm. We have a lot of questions, so I'm going to dive into them. Keith asks, if Republicans are able to enact a nationwide abortion ban, what are the consequences for states that simply choose to defy that hypothetical? So again, we're getting into speculative territory, but I, I you know, we really want to try to imagine where this leads us. So David, I'm curious for your take on that. What would happen? Well, so there's- And how likely of... is that, I should say? Is that something we should anticipate? <laughs> well, I would, I used to say extremely destabilizing events are not necessarily likely. I'm less apt to say that extremely destabilizing <laughs> events are- less likely. I could easily, I could actually easily imagine a circumstance like that, but only if the filibuster is removed or there's one party gets such a landslide at the Senate that they can cross the 60 vote threshold. So I think it's unlikely. Um, but what you would have is you had a federal abortion ban, you would have federal law enforcement that would enforce it. And so a state saying they're not going to comply doesn't do one thing to inhibit federal law enforcement from enforcing federal law. Well, I, I mean, you could refuse to cooperate with federal law, law enforcement, for example, but federal law enforcement would still have jurisdiction, even if a state tried some version of nullification. Um, but the supremacy clause would apply the federal law to the states. 
federal law enforcement would still have jurisdiction even over states that said they were going to defy it. I don't think that scenario is likely, but I am at the point, you know, before I also didn't think January 6th, something like January 6th would ever happen. So I have, I approach the more um, apocalyptic types, polarizing scenarios with a lot more um, humility and trepidation than I used to. And David, for you as someone who is, has described yourself as pro-life, do you have any reservations about the way this came to pass or are you, is your position more that, you know, hopefully we get to that more democratic, more settled place as a country. I'm, I'm sort of curious because it, like you said, it came as a surprise to you. Do you, yeah. I'm just sort of curious how you're processing it. So I have, I believe in my view, the court's decision was correct and it's happening at a bad time in our country. <laughs> and when I say happening in a bad time, I don't just mean a bad time in the sense that we're polarized. We've been polarized a lot. It's happening at a bad time on the right, which is supposed to be, especially mm. in red state, let red legislatures, which they're going to be the ones immediately reacting in ways. Because if you're in a blue state, your, your abortion rights have not changed. If you're in a blue state, you, you still have access to abortion. If you're in a red state, that's where abortion rights are changing. And in a red state, red states right now, sadly, are captured by a spirit of, as I said earlier, of like, of really performative, punitive, legislating. And, and we have seen this in other circumstances where red states, which used to be strongly, uh, at least proclaim they're strongly supportive of, say, the First Amendment and academic freedom, are now clamping down on speech and clamping down even on academic freedom and even clamping down on corporate speech and private speech out of the uh, academy because of you know CRT or LGBT kinds of panics that are happening. So this is a very difficult environment to pass thoughtful, compassionate legislation. And that gives me a great sense of disquiet. As I wrote in The Atlantic, I said, I, had, I was grateful for the decision, but I had disquiet because of the cultural atmosphere in which it lands. Hmm. Another question from someone who's with us today, uh, Miriam asks, is there a religious liberty issue here? Prohibiting abortion seems to me to be based on the idea that life begins at, at conception, which is a religious dogma, she says. Um, and she gives the example of Judaism, which the Atlantic has covered this as well, that some interpretations would say that this goes against uh, a core be belief in Judaism. Mary, what what do you think on this one? Should we expect to see actual legal challenges related to this question of religious liberty? How are you thinking about this? I mean, we're already seeing them, right? So there's a synagogue uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, that's bringing um, a religious liberty suit against that state's recent 15-week um, abortion ban. And we've seen these laws and the, uh, these challenges in the past. Um, they've often faced kind of procedural hurdles because the court will say, you know, in other words, the court would often want someone who is about to imminently be having an abortion or performing an abortion or something who's suffering that kind of injury that the court is looking for and what it and when it's looking for standing, right? It wants some kind of immediate kind of skin in the game that sometimes has been missing when religious liberty claims are raised. Um, I think the reason we're going to see more of this is because even as the Supreme Court has been changing, you know, the Second Amendment, its interpretation of the Second Amendment and the right to abortion, it's been changing pretty dramatically its interpretation of the religion clauses. So um, expanding pretty considerably its ideas of religious liberty, um, contracting pretty considerably its ideas about the separation of church and state. And so I think this is to some degree people saying, well, if, if religious liberties are more capacious than we used to think, doesn't that apply to people whose religious values would point them to thinking that abortion was not only permitted under certain circumstances, but mandatory. Um, I'm, you know, I imagine that given the way the Supreme Court um, operates, there'll be a way of that that claim won't work. It'll probably be procedural. I've seen um, arguments made that uh, this is not, you know, that, that this is an argument in Reform Judaism and Reform Judaism isn't really a religion. Those are obviously, I think, ridiculous kind of offensive arguments that dispute the sincerity of people's religious beliefs, which is something I think we've moved beyond um, as a you know, constitutional order. The Supreme Court got that right in the 40s when it said judges shouldn't be in the business of telling people their beliefs are insincere or irrelevant. Um, but I, I think that there are procedural hurdles. Whether people, that claim is not going away though, right? So I think that if you found the right plaintiff um, with the right kind of religious objection, uh, it will be difficult for the Supreme Court, I think, to deal with that kind of claim without people saying, you know, religious liberty matters, but not equally 
for all faith communities. And obviously that's something that we, we wouldn't want to see as a policy matter. And it would raise pretty profound constitutional concerns too, because one of the kind of first principles when it comes to the religion clauses is that you can't prefer some faith traditions over others. And I think that's pe what people are wondering if that's something that's going to happen or if this court will kind of find a way to reassure people that the expansion of religious liberty is something that's gonna be equally available to everyone. We have time for one more question, although it looks oh, can like Can I David... jump on that real yeah, fast? Please, yeah, please jump this in. Is, this is interesting because I agree with Mary, these religious liberty challenges are going to proliferate. That that's They're already filed, they'll be filed. So here's the really interesting question. So if I, one of the defenses to one of those religious liberty lawsuits would be, okay, but if they're, if the state recognizes the life of the unborn child, then the, your religious liberty does not extend to the ability to harm another person. Interestingly, at the same time, we've been seeing a lot of religious liberty challenges to vaccine mandates coming from the right. Okay. And so the, in those circumstances, if you're talking about a communicable disease and a vaccine that has the potential to prevent and limit transmission of a communicable disease, what you're saying is my religious liberty right is broad enough to where I can potentially inf uh, inflict upon another person hmm. a dangerous, uh, you know, a dangerous germ or dangerous virus, you know. And so there's some tension there with the idea that says I might have a, I have a religious liberty right to refuse a vaccine. And saying, then turning around and saying, there's no religious liberty right um, to an abortion if the analysis is based on um, what is what impacts other people and doesn't impact other people. Now, the, the religious liberty analysis is more complicated than that, but that that's an 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 element of it that I find pretty fascinating. Just as I've been very very troubled by the prevalence of anti-vax sentiment in the pro-life right. Yeah, yeah and I think that, and in the background of a lot of this is going to be anytime those challenges come up, that's going to be another opportunity for the Supreme Court to think about what it thinks about this interest in protecting life, right? Is that like something that's going to turn into a full-blown constitutional protection for life in the womb or for fetuses? Like, that's something that folks... There are some folks in the in the pro-life or anti-abortion movement absolutely want to do. And so I think one thing David's pointing out is if that claim goes to court, we're going to see that as a counter argument, right? There's going to be lots of things teed up for the Supreme Court if it wants to think more about fetal personhood. Um, there are going to be ways that that's going to, I think, easily be kind of served up. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question for you. And this does go to some of the medical questions we were getting at earlier, as well as I think the question of how punitive states will be. Uh, Martha asks, what is the impact on the medical profession specifically? Um, well, she's asking about sort of patient being able to treat patients without fear of arrest. But here's the part that I found really interesting that I haven't seen others ask yet, which is um, how we should think about HIPAA in this regard. So the, a patient's right to privacy versus uh obviously upholding or enforcing new laws. How, how do you see the interplay between those two things? Like if a patient, and hopefully I'm interpreting Martha's question correctly here, but if a patient comes uh, to a doctor having taken an abortion pill and discloses that, does the doctor uphold HIPAA or does the doctor uphold, um, you know, f go with the the overturning of Roe and the laws that have flown, uh, flowed from that? I'm going to punt that one to you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not a HIPAA expert either, but I know that there are HIPAA exceptions, um, and some mm -hmm. I, I, states may have mandatory reporting laws for abortion. Um, I right. think uh, they're usually HIPAA exceptions for the commission of a crime. Um, mm -hmm. At the moment, I think, uh, and David's already said this, and this is true. Well, there are some states that did a lousy job writing their laws because they were performative laws that don't explicitly say, hey, we're not going to punish pregnant people. So maybe, you know, some prosecutor could get it, the idea that that would be a crime, you know, having a self-managed abortion. Most states that did bother to say something have said that's not a crime like Texas. So I don't know if those exceptions would apply. So, I mean, I'm less worried um, about kind of direct disclosure HIPAA violations from a kind of privacy standpoint than I am just about garden variety privacy violations involving digital data. So um, we know that law enforcement agencies can purchase data the same way that targeted advertisers that have the pop-up ads in your feed do. Um, and so there may be, it may be easier, I think, and probably less legally complicated if states are on this kind of punitive route to be looking at things like 
you know, your Google search data, GPS location data, and so on. Um, and obviously that's, that should concern people, I would think, regardless of their views on abortion, because for states to meaningfully enforce these laws, they would have to be potentially serving a larger group of people, right? It would not, it would be hard to figure out who's seeking an abortion without potentially serving lots of people who are not. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm more I'm more worried about that kind of threat, like from a digital surveillance standpoint um, than I am directly. Although, I, like I said, I mean, states have mandatory reporting laws in other contexts like child abuse. There's a long historical tradition in states that are conservative of um, kind of linking child abuse laws to concerns about abortion and to punishing people using child abuse laws for kind of abortion adjacent conduct or conduct during pregnancy. So I could imagine there being kind of mandatory reporting laws that get into Mm -hmm. HIPAA complexities. I haven't seen a lot of that yet, um, but I'm also not, you know, I'm not a HIPAA person. So I may, I may be the wrong person for that one too. Well, I have so many more questions for you both and I'm so grateful for your time, but we are out of time for today. Um, I'll just say thank you so much to everyone who has joined us and, and really thank you to Mary and David. I know this topic is incredibly complex and hugely important, and I'm especially grateful to have people with different viewpoints coming to, to join us to talk about this. So thank you both and thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everybody.